I would like to have my previous comment about being in sync with you expunged from the record. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music. Jason and Joe here, and we are kicking off Jaskus. Uh, clever play on words there. A combination of my name and August. I am choosing all of the artists that we cover this month. And uh, very disappointed to see Kramzer bailing on the first week. He'll be back for the rest of it. But uh, skipping out on Warren Zevon, uh, we've got 12 albums to rank. I am choosing Warren Zevon because I think he's a fantastic songwriter. I've liked him for quite a while. I think I got into him right around the time that The Wind came out. There was that documentary about the making of the record. Probably also right around that time is when I got his greatest hits uh, compilation called Genius. Uh, which had about 18 tracks on it or so. Um, so kind of worked backwards from there, got into the records after I knew the greatest hits. I think I've heard all of these before, except maybe the first one. I don't know if I ever went back and listened to Wanted uh, Dead or Alive before. Um, how much Warren Zevon did you know before the week? I knew, I'm going to try and think here, four songs, I believe. Um, one of them was a cover. His Back in the High Life Again cover, Steve Winwood. I knew Keep Me in My Heart, or whatever it's called. Um, the final Keep You in My Heart, Keep Me in Your Heart. Uh, final track from The Wind. And I knew the two they play on the radio. Uh, Lawyers, Guns, and Money. And um, Werewolves of London. And that's pretty much it. I may have gone back and listened to you had one of them as your uh, song of the year winner, French Inhaler, correct? So I went back and listened to that one. So I have five songs I know from Warren Zevon. So it's just completely inexperienced raw coming into this this week here. All right. So if you are new to the channel and don't know what we do here, every week we cover a different artist. Um, sometimes they're favorite artists of ours that we know and love. Sometimes they are new to us. Sometimes we don't like them. Sometimes we love them. Um, every week we cover a different one. Like I said, uh, we rank all of their albums on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we give you our top 10 favorite songs. And on Thursday, we have a third discussion video inspired by that artist. Uh, so yeah, we're here to rank the records today. 12 of them, like I said. Uh, you want to kick us off with your least favorite Warren Zevon record? Sure. Uh, I hope this one is at the bottom for everybody. I got Wanted Dead or Alive. And it's, you know, this one came out six years before the self-titled Warren Zevon, which I assumed was his debut. I think most people did or do. Uh, and this one stinks. It's good that he took some time off because, man, it, it just sounds so amateurish. Like there's just weird, um, like, one, the music is way too loud. The vocals are too low. You can't hear what he's saying half the time probably there's songs like she quit me which has like this really bad piano that just like drops in and sounds like it shouldn't even be in the song uh kim fowley began the project as a producer and he left because zevon was doing too much and was playing all the instruments and everything so um it's i mean it's not all terrible i think that ico ico or eco eco uh, cover is, is decent Tule's blues is okay but I didn't like it much I give it uh, two and, uh, two stars I'll go two stars all right yeah that's probably the correct answer my number 12 is also wanted dead or alive self-produced like you said Kim Fowley started on it they didn't see eye to eye on it Zevon wanted too much control so he walked out and didn't even want his name on it so yeah I think this is like one of the biggest false starts in rock history you know, after he made this, he uh, went on to be the uh, musical coordinator for the Ever Everly Brothers for a while. Uh, it does have Skip Batten of the Birds playing bass on it. Uh, the songs just aren't that great. It's very underproduced. A lot of the record sounds like demo quality recordings. Not very focused. Tries a lot of different styles. None of them work that well. I don't think it. it's like embarrassingly bad but it's not good. I think it's just so far from the level of brilliant writing he would return with in 76. You know, it's almost hard to imagine that this is even the same person writing some of these songs. 
it does have its moments. Like you said, Thule's Blues hints at some potential. But yeah, I think this record will be of interest to like hardcore fans. But I think casual listeners can give this one a skip. And it is uh, two stars for me as well. All right. My number 11. It's tough for me to... I, I didn't have probably enough time to listen to all of these, especially coming in so raw. So my list might be just completely out there. Don't know. Don't care. My pick will be My Rides Here, which was second last, is penultimate. I love that word. Album. This one... It just didn't didn't grab me really much at all. I I like the big rock sound on the opener, Sacrificial Lambs. I really do like Hit Somebody, the hockey song. I think it's maybe the best song that integrates like sports ever. I'm trying to think of like other ones. I hate Center Field, one of my least favorite songs of all time. And this one just eschews all of that uh, nonsense. And it's as a big hockey fan and part Canadian uh I like the details he gets right here so uh you know the rhyming schemes and everything working in the the team names in Alberta and Calgary and all this stuff I think it's pretty clever David Letterman does some backing vocals he yells hit somebody which is pretty hilarious um but other than those two nothing else really works for me I do not like McGillicuddy's reeks uh it's an awkward thing to say the twee Irish jig doesn't do it for me. I think the lyrics are too wordy. Really don't like the cover of Serge Gainsbourg's Laissez moi tranquille, whatever, however you say it. So, I mean, everything else kind of just floated by without me taking much notice of anything, any particular lyric or instrumental passage. Bunch of covers, the I Have to Leave by Dan McFarlane, uh, the Lazy Moi from surge and um, most of the tracks have a co-writing credit so i don't know if that hurt it or something maybe some of the wit and um you know zevon's personal style got sucked out a little bit so i have it at two and a half stars it just uh, didn't do much for me well we're off to a good start my number 11 is also my rides here self-produced he's produced uh self-produced a couple of his records usually not a great thing uh i think he's helped by a good producer this one was released right before his diagnosis. I think it came out a couple of weeks before he was diagnosed. Um, I don't think it's a great sounding record. The bass is a little out of control on it. Uh, most of the songwriting is pretty mediocre. There's a really big Celtic influence on both Lord Byron's luggage and McGillicuddy's reeks. And like Joe, I, I just I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, you're a whole different person when you're scared, I think is a pretty rough track. Uh, not very good. Uh, Hit Somebody Hockey Song, I think is fun. Um, the Letterman cameo is ridiculous. It's just kind of light. I think there's a problem with that being the best song on the record, though. It's just kind of like this light kind of novelty type of track. Um, but really, that's like the, the best part of the record. You do have Anton Fig on drums. Um, played with Ace Freely a lot probably best known for being part of Letterman's band with Paul Schaefer. Uh, Paul Schaefer appears on Hit Somebody as well. The album is supposed to be a meditation on death. Um, I don't know if I picked up on that a ton on the record. He did write it with a bunch of outside writers. Like you said, a lot of co-writes, maybe that hurt it a little as well. A lot of the co-writers are not musicians, even a lot of like novelists and writer types helping him write the songs. I don't know. It just never really comes together. I think it's one of the very few albums of his without a truly great song on it. Yeah. Like I said, the best part of it is that that kind of silly hit somebody song. I don't know about that being the best integration of sports into song. I really like the baseball project records, but yeah, that's a good one. And like I said, could have used a producer, could have been a little more focused, could have sounded better. But really, the real problem is the songwriting. It's just not his usual standard. Um, so I am at two and a half on that one. All right. Now we're getting to my sea of three star albums and there's a bunch of them. And I don't even know what my next is going to be. I guess Mr. Bad Example, just because I remember so little about it. Uh, one that I kind of forgot even was an album that we were doing for this week. Listen to it like last minute. So I could be way off, but just another one. I mean, this is early 90s after Transverse City. 
which was at least an interesting stab at something different. And this one kind of just goes back to Warren Zevon, the singer songwriter. Nothing too exciting that I remember. That's about it. There's really nothing more for me to say about this album other than I don't really remember anything about it other than it just sort of, you know, fell into, there seems to be like four or five of these albums that just exist. And I don't see the point of them. Like, I don't think he's doing anything new or different or too interesting here. And to me, everything is just in the shadow of one monumental record. So just not, uh, not anything I'd go back to for Mr. Bad Example. Three stars. We are right in step. Uh, I also have Mr. Bad Example, number 10. Wadi Watel produced. Uh, you know, if you look at his early records, you have these huge lists of personnel, all these guests coming in. This has got one of his shortest lists of personnel, not as many players on it. Uh, finishing touches, not a great start to the record. Uh, you have Jeff Percaro and Bob Glaub as the rhythm section. Amazing players, some of my favorite um, musicians. Percaro is an amazing drummer. Bob Glaub's a really great bass player. And they play on a lot of this record, and they are definitely a weakness of it. It is really awkwardly stiff very mechanical sounding. I don't know if something was done to their parts, uh, if they were like quantized or something, uh, but it does not sound very loose or have much feel to it at all. Quite Ugly One Morning has kind of that same stiff mechanical feel. The production just isn't great on this. Um, you got that really weird, awful synth on Angel Dressed in Black, uh, which is just, I don't know, what the decision making was there it sounds terrible doesn't fit the song at all uh the whole feel of this record just has this real low budget quality to it um even down to the dull black and gray album cover slap some text on it it just seems really really um low budget it is not without a few highlights though um the country tune heartache spoken here i think is really good featuring dwight yoakam i enjoy that tune i think renegade is a pretty good song and the two tracks where Jim Keltner comes in on, on drums instead of Percaro have a much looser feel um, and sound way better. Uh, Searching for a Heart, I think, is a nice closer. It's a little bit of a corny ballad, but it's a, it's a decent song. So, you know, there's there's moments here, but overall, it just uh, doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of uh, interest in it being made. It just seems a little just like thrown together. Um, three stars for me. We'll go to the next album in his discography. Uh, four years later, he came back with Mutineer. And I don't know, maybe it's, I mean, he got dropped from the major label after Transverse City, I believe. So on Mr. Bad Example and Mutineer, he's on Giant Records, which I don't know what it is. I guess it's like a minor, it's not like a indie label, but uh, maybe they cut his budgets a little bit or something. Um, this one, I think it's a little bit better than Mr. Bad Example, but still, I think it's a three-star album. And I don't know, his writing style around like the 90s after Transverse City, I don't know, he, he loses something. Like he's still trying to do what he was doing in the 70s with sort of the black humor and the Morden wit and everything. But I don't know, his, his writing just isn't as sharp and when it isn't as sharp, like it really kind of falls off a cliff for me. Like it's either on and it really works or it's like trying way too hard and it doesn't work at all. And this one, it's kind of like you strip all the nuance from Randy Newman is sort of what Zevon's going with for me here. Uh, something bad happened to a clown. I uh, do not like that one much at all. It's just like, there's no, there's no like satire or anything. It's just like, his words, what he's saying, like, that's all it is. Don't like that one much. I do like sort of the Elvis Costello jazzy lounginess that he's doing on Similar to Rain. A uh, little different vocal style kind of works. But the, the Jesus Was a Crossmaker, which just a phenomenal song. Uh, hard to cover that one. It's an odd cover choice uh, from Judy Sill. And it's okay. Uh, the accordion, not probably my um 
is it an accordion whatever it is piano accordion uh doesn't quite work for me on that one and everything else it's just um i don't know he's trying too hard to be witty or funny and it just doesn't work and the music isn't quite as good um you know he's missing like the big producer and I don't know. I miss like the Eagles on backing vocals and stuff like that. Like that's that's the Zevon I want. This one just doesn't do much. Uh, three stars. It's not terrible, but I don't know. Who needs it? All right. My number nine. This is where Joe and I diverge. Um, I've got the Envoy from 1981. Um, opens with the title track, which describes the situation in the Middle East. Kind of like what Joe is saying about his later writing where it's kind of just like is what it is i don't think there's like a real like subtext or layers to it um but it does have some cool guitar from wadi but the whole thing i think is just undermined by bad keyboard sounds starting to get into the 80s a little here this is 81 i like uh the hula hula boys as a song i think it's a pretty cool track but i really do not like the recorder solos I get what they were going for, like the whole Hawaiian thing and, you know, going for that vibe. But uh, even still, just really cheesy sounding. Um, not a big fan of the recorder as an instrument, generally speaking. Let Nothing Come Between You, I think, had some moderate success on mainstream rock charts. Uh, ain't That Pretty at All, I think, has some, uh, like, a cool, aggressive vocal delivery from Zevon. But again, bad synths. Uh, the snare on Charlie's Medicine, I think, is really bad sounding, although that track does have a, a great Wadi guitar solo. Looking for the Next Best Thing has a cheesy synth lead, but I think it might be the best written song on the record. Really good harmonies from Graham Nash and J.D. Souther on that one. Uh, this record, I think, just has some of his least impressive and interesting songwriting. I don't think it's terrible sounding, but there's a lot of lame keyboards and synths on it. And just not a lot of standout tracks. I think the guitar work on it is the highlight. Uh, Wadi Watel playing most of the guitars on this record. And I think the closer, Never Too Late for Love, is a really great track. Um, so it's not a total loss. It's okay. Um, but yeah, kind of feeling how you are about... There's a there's a sizable chunk of three-star records in his catalog. And uh, this is one of them. Mm, sure is. That's why it is my number eight. I'm going eight. I'm going eight. I eight. Mean, I uh between this and mutineers pretty much no difference i do like this one a little bit more i'm not quite as opposed to the 80s sound as you so that doesn't bother me too much but you do i mean it's rough to hear an artist like warren zevon whose music sounds so good in the 70s with you know jackson brown's production and, and everything enter the 80s and you've got like those crappy sim keyboards coming in and just the sound in general is so much down. Like it's such a big difference between just this and a couple of years ago with Excitable Boy, which sucks, but you'll have that. That's what happened in the 80s. Everything was worse. But I do kind of like the Envoy, at least um, guitar wise. I agree totally. Wadi, definitely the highlight, his guitar work on this album. I hate hula hula boys though. I, I just fake tears on she don't care about me, like the gulping and the recorder stuff. It just seems a little phony and trying too hard. And you you do have like Don Henley and Lindsay Buckingham and some people doing uh backing vocals, JD Souther, uh Graham Nash. So it's not like this is devoid of talent, but it's just I don't know, unfocused, uninteresting. And a lot of the album is just like super low energy after the Envoy, which I think, think at least musically is pretty cool, even if lyrically it's like, okay, it's here's a list of things going on in the Middle East. And what's the point? Like, where's where are you going with this, Warren? I don't know. You never really get to any point on it. But yeah, it's a, it's a three-star album and kind of disappointing. And the label didn't like it because they dropped his ass <laughs> right after it came out. All right, my next one may be controversial, but I don't think it should be too terribly upsetting. I've got Sentimental Hygiene at number eight. There was like a five or six year gap between the Envoy and this uh, after he was dropped from his label, like you said. 
Um, a lot of guests as usual, but you get some different names this time. You've got all of REM appearing on the record. And in fact, I think they are uh, pretty much the main band throughout most of the record, backing him up. Uh, you've got Mike Campbell, Bob Dylan, Flea, Tony Levin, Stan Lynch, Neil Young, Brian Setzer. I think the songwriting on this album is better than it was on the Envoy, but I think the production is even worse. I hate the drum sounds on this record. It's got that real 1987 sound, which during Songs of the Year, we said, you know, a very distinct sound, probably the most distinct sounding year of all time. And that can work for a lot of pop and, you know, some metal stuff, but it's not working for Warren at all. Uh, I just think it doesn't match his writing. Uh, Reconsider Me, I think, is a great song, though. It's among his all-time best. Uh, Bad Karma is decent and sounds better than a lot of the record does. It sort of sounds like a Mellencamp tune. Uh, same with uh, Even a Dog Can Shake Hands. I think this record works best when he's kind of in that more straightforward rock mode. Uh, he kind of in that Heartland sort of sound. But when he starts adding the synths and the keys, things can go really wrong, like on the title track and Leave My Monkey Alone, which I think are just wrecks. Um, the Heartache, I think it's a good ballad. So there's some okay stuff here. Definitely better than The Envoy when it comes to the writing, but it's hard for me to get past the production. And there are still a few awful tracks uh, like Boom Boom Mancini, which I, I think is terrible. That was actually on that Greatest Hits collection that I had, and I can't understand why. Um, I just think it's one of his worst songs. Um so it's it's okay. It's fine. There's there's some okay stuff on it. The writing is okay here and there. Um, but yeah, just a just a bad, I don't enjoy this sound very much. So three stars for sentimental hygiene. Yeah, it's uh my number seven. And yeah, it's another one people talk about in Discord, like it's a really good album that you know, among his best. I don't hear it that way. I think with the amount of guest stars on here and big names just like every single person on here mike campbell bob dylan flea don henley tony levin and leland sklar and michael stipe and all these huge names just incredible players and what the output is just like it this is it this is all you got from all that um and i hate boom boom mancini i good lord that song sucks I uh, hate the lyrics, just a really rotten song. And I hate the the phrase sentimental hygiene. I think it's one of the worst album titles ever. Like sentimental hygiene, what the hell does that even mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's annoying. I don't, I just don't like anything about it. I don't like the song. Um, but, and um, I also hate the factory. Let's talk about that one real quick. Um one of the biggest problems I have with Zevon is the repetition of words. Like there's so many songs that just cycle around like one phrase, like sentimental hygiene, just over and over again. Same thing with Boom Boom Mancini. Like he always comes back to these words and like the entire song is based around them. And it's just like too much for me. Like there's not enough variation and a lot of the choruses and stuff just keep coming back to it. And it gets really aggravating. Uh, it was one of the things I liked least about this whole week because uh, he does it so much. And um, I thought that was interesting because he can be such a good writer, but then he relies on those like buzzwords way too much. Um, same with on the factory. Um, musically, I think it's pretty ordinary. Like he's trying to do maybe like a Springsteen or a Bob Dylan, you know, workers, right, class, whatever. And it, it just kind of comes off as stilted and, um, you know, not clever enough to make it really work. So didn't like that one. Uh, Reconsider Me is great, though. Uh, really good. I like at this era, I think when he does the heartfelt, like sincere songs a lot better than when he's trying to do a sarcastic or a, you know, workers' rights kind of thing, uh, you know, critique of capitalism, that kind of thing. I'll take the sincere stuff. Reconsider Me is great. The Heartache, uh, Bad Karma is pretty good. But uh, a lot of the other songs don't, don't like too much. 
Um, so I don't even know why this is as high on my list. Three stars, but the way I'm talking about it, it should be like last. So I don't know. Maybe I gotta drop it down a little bit. All right. My number seven is Mutineer from 1995, self-produced, made in his home studio. And I, it seems like most of the playing on the record is him as well. Um, you know, he played guitar, a lot of the keys. He's listed as a per- percussionist even. Um, and there's only a few guest spots too. So this is a mostly solo affair. And I think that makes it fairly unique in his catalog. Like kind of part of his whole thing is like LA session players. Um, and this doesn't have a lot of that. Not crazy at all about the opener, Seminole Bingo. Not a very good song. Uh, and an even worse opening track. Something bad, I think, is it, got some pretty bad key sounds and uh, really shouldn't work. But somehow it does, uh, even with Warren struggling to hit some of the higher notes. Uh, something about that song I just kind of like. Um, similar to Rain has this really haunting, sparse, almost like spooky arrangement, which is really cool. And I think there's something kind of refreshing about hearing him so stripped back with all of, without all of the session players. I think there's a rawness to this record that most of his other records don't have. And, and maybe an intimacy to it as well that you don't see a lot in his catalog. Unfortunately, I don't think it's his greatest songwriting um, outside of the title track, which is fantastic. Um, Seminole Bingo, Rottweiler Weiler Blues, uh, Monkey Wash, Donkey Rinse, uh, not great tracks. The record sonically reminds me a little of uh, the Phil Collins record, Both Sides, with some of the key sounds and like the overall vibe of the record. But I think Both Sides has more good songs than this one does. I do think this is an interesting effort, though. I'm at three stars. It's my last three stars. It's close to three and a half. I think it's decent in some interesting moments, like a lot of these three-star records. I don't think there's too many records of his that don't have like a couple really good songs. Um, and this one has has its moments. Uh, title track especially is very, very good. So three stars for Mutant Year. All right. Uh, I'm still at three stars for a little bit longer. My number six I go with Transverse City. And I do appreciate this one. Uh, I wanted to like it more than I did because I think it starts off great. But I think in the end, it's sort of like a noble failure because he is trying a bunch of new stuff at the beginning. Like it's kind of a futuristic sound. He's got a concept about uh, who knows what um, the world kind of winding down and post-capitalism, whatever. Uh, and I think he starts off strong with Transverse City, runs straight down, long arm, long arm of the law. I think these are all interesting tracks that sound unique, uh, 80s sounding, but also like a little futuristic, which is cool. Uh, Jerry Garcia and David Gilmore do some guest spots. Jerry Garcia sounds like David Gilmore um, when he's playing. So you get a lot of stuff that sounds like David Gilmore guesting which is cool. It's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but then after that, it kind of falls apart for me a little bit. You got Turbulence, which is okay. Uh, they Move the Moon is cool at first, and it kind of gets old. Splendid Isolation Networking are just snooze-worthy. Networking is like Bob Dylan meets Steve Jobs, kind of not, not that interesting. A little too much like technical details. And uh, again, with like down in the mall, like it was okay. It's a critique of capitalism and malls. Like we get it, but the lyrics are just so direct, and there's no, there's like, there's no satire there. Everything is so obvious. Like I'm, I'm looking for like a second layer of what he's talking about, but it's just straight. It's, it's like Randy Newman as done by Family Guy. It's like this is what's happening. This is what's in a mall, and it's like okay, but. Is there something else? Like, is it you're just going to talk about like buying lingerie at the mall? Like, yeah, we know it's what a mall is for. Uh, so I don't know. I think he had some cool ideas here. I don't think they're completely executed um, well, but it is like, you know, like I said, it's a noble failure because at least he was trying something new and going for a different vibe. Uh, and I do like um, the jazzy piano in the long arm of the law i think that's really cool sounding uh chick korea on that one so some cool stuff but as a whole as a whole album it just kind of falls apart so still at three for transverse city 
Well, this is the most in sync Joe and I have been in a long time. I have Transverse City at number six. I'm up to three and a half, though, on it. I think it's good. Um, you know, he used REM on the previous record, and I think that helped to bolster his career a little bit. Um, he goes back to kind of like the classic rock heavyweights on this one, as far as his guests are concerned. David Gilmour, Jerry Garcia, Chick Corea, Howie Epstein, Neil Young. Uh, you got a couple guys from Jefferson Airplane in there as well. I think this is a better sounding record. It still sounds like the 80s a lot, but I don't mind the drum sounds as much. And the whole thing has a little more muscle to it, I think. Uh, Run Straight Down is an okay song. Not not that special, but it's got some killer guitar playing from David Gilmore, who unleashes a great solo, even by his high standards. I think it's an amazing David Gilmore solo. Uh, like you said, Korea's piano on Long Arm of the Law really elevates the song. I think he gets a lot of nice work out of the guests on this record. I think they do a lot to elevate the sound and the whole feel of the record. I don't know how strong these songs would be without them. Uh, you called Splendid Isolation a snooze, but I think that is the highlight of the record. I think that's a, a pretty good song. Nothing fancy, simple arrangement that works. It's got real Tom Petty vibes, uh, which makes sense considering it's got Mike Campbell on guitar. Uh, Network keeps that trend going with Ben Montench on organ and Howie Epstein playing mandolin. Neil Young plays guitar on Gridlock, but that song, I think, is one that is not benefited by the guest. I think that's a pretty clunky rocker. Um, this record overall, I think, is a little bit of a mixed bag, but outside of a few tracks, I like the production. Uh, it's got some good songs, and I think the guest uh, con contributions are really cool. I think it, that can make the record feel a little disjointed, like you've got some different um, competing sounds happening on this record. But I don't think it over hurts the overall listen experience too much. Uh, I enjoyed this one. This is one that I, I think I've heard before, but wasn't super familiar with or, or one that I've spent a lot of time with. So I was actually surprised by how much I liked this one this time. Uh, three and a half stars for Transverse City. All right. So this is where things go off the track. Um, my number five going to be an album that everyone else most people will have a number one, number two, uh, not me. I don't like this album, and I don't like, I don't know. There's there's something about this album kind of bugs me. It is Excitable Boy, and I, yeah, I know. It's at three stars. It sounds fantastic. Instrumentation, production, immaculate. I just don't like these songs. I don't like Werewolves of London that much. Uh a rip off of Sweet Home Alabama. Let's just call it like it is. It sounds great. I love the Fleetwood Mac rhythm section on it. It's great. Uh, Mick Fleetwood, John McVie. I don't like Roland the Headless Thompson Gunner at all. Uh, I think the lyrics a little silly. Doesn't draw me in. It feels too long. There's too much repetition. Again, he's just going off of these like phrases. The role in the Headless Thompson Gunner. And he just keeps working it in all over the place. It just doesn't doesn't do anything for me. I like the backing vocals, uh, which just fantastic throughout the whole album. And that's the highlight for me. But um, I don't like Excitable Boy at all. I don't like the, the gruesome lyrics and the, the lighthearted music. Like, I get it. It's, you know, a juxtaposition. That's, that's fine. I just, I think it's too much, like, He's going too far into the, you know, the rape and murder and the serial killing. And there's just no nuance. There's no, like, I don't know. There, there's nothing there. Like, he's just saying these words for shock value. And you get in the, excitable boy. Like the, and it's like, that's kind of clever, but it just feels like it's missing, like, some critique or, or something else. Um, accidentally, like a martyr don't care for don't like Veracruz that much turning us on the block is nice um but I don't know these these songs just do nothing for me other than I do like Johnny Strikes Up the band I think it starts off well uh, I really like the bass work on that uh, Nighttime in the Switching Yard's got a cool disco funk feel to it I mean, great instrumentation some really cool it has a really great bridge that i like when it kind of builds up uh cool stuff some funk guitar and then i think lawyers guns and monies is a great song 
uh, I think the lyrics were great there. Guitar work, uh, fantastic. But even that, like, there's a little too much repetition. It's just like the same, like, good. It's a very good, like, little phrase. It just, they just go the hell out of it. They're just repeating and repeating a little too much. And it seems like all the songs had that same sort of like, here's one good idea. We're just going to murder that one idea to death just over and over and over again. So as good as it sounds and as great as the guest stars are and everything else, I just do not think the songs are very good. And yeah, I'm sure I'm on an island on this one, but uh, just does nothing for me. I would like to have my previous comment about being in sync with you expunged from the record. <laughs> Uh, oof. my number five is Life Will Kill Ya from 2000. Rolling Stone called it his best since Excitable Boy. I think it helps on this one that the production really stays out of the way. You don't really notice it much where like most of the records prior to this, especially like through the 80s and 90s, like the, the production is really noticeable. It's all you can think about half the time listening to the records. This one feels and sounds really natural. It doesn't seem labored over. Uh, sounds pretty good. Um, it's l a little light on like really, really great songs, but it has a lot of good songs, I think. I'll Slow You Down. For my next trick, I'll Need a Volunteer. Hostage O. Ourselves to Know. Uh, Don't Let Us Get Sick. Uh, maybe my favorite um, kind of sad track in hi hindsight. Um yeah, there's there's a bunch of good songs on here. I think maybe it's a little bit of a safe record, but I probably what he needed to do at the time was make a safe record. And it's a well executed safe record. Um, you know, I think he sticks the landing, um, doesn't make any egregious errors as he was making on like some of these previous previous records as far as the production and stuff go. It's just kind of like a good, decent little record with some good songwriting. I don't think it's amazing, but it's it's solid. Uh, three and a half stars for Life Will Kill Ya. All right, number four, and I'm going to go up to three and a half stars. I'm, I'm there uh, for The Wind, his final effort. Uh, and I just like the way this one sounds. Like, this is a really good rebound uh, from my rides here, which, I don't know, it was, I think, our 11 or, what, or whatever. So neither of us like that one much. I think this one's a lot better. Um, and I don't know the story behind it. I don't know when, if he wrote all these songs after he was diagnosed. I mean, they just have a poignancy to them that, I mean, maybe staring down death really, you know, um, you know, brought the best out of his his uh, writing. I think it's more mature uh, for the most part, uh, but he still throws in some of those classic Zevonisms, the My Dirty Life and Times sort of the you know, self-deprecating little history there. I think the cover of Knock on Heaven's Door is pretty darn good for that song. I'm not a huge fan of that song, but I think he does it well. Uh, Numb, Numb as the Statue's nice, uh, great backing vocals. And despite like, I mean, there's like a murderer's row again of guest stars on like every single track. It doesn't overwhelm uh, the sound. I think it's very Warren Zevon-y like, you get you know, Jackson Brown and Billy Bob Thornton and T-Bone Burnett and uh, Ry Cooter on Prison Grove, but it still sounds like a, a Warren Zevon song. Um, you know, Dwight Yoakam does backing vocals on Dirty Life and Times. Um, and there's just, you know, people on everything. Emmylou Harris on Please Stay, Joe Walsh, slide guitar and Rubbing Raw. So there, there's all these guest stars, but I think it's very much Warren Zevon's show. And it sounds good. I think every song on here is good. There's no bad songs. Uh, Keep Me In Your Heart, perfect emotional closer. Really good. Um, and it, it's just a good album. It's not my preferred, you know, favorite style, but I think it's very well done. And uh, three and a half stars for that one. All right. My number four is The Wind as well. I am up to four stars on this one. I'm glad he was able to squeeze this one out after being diagnosed. A much better note for him to go out on than my rides here. And like you said, if you thought he had a lot of yes on his previous albums, everyone and their mother show up for this one to send Warren off properly. Even like you, know, you named all those names, but even people that you don't normally associate with like the Warren Zevon circle 
are on this, like Tommy Shaw from Styx is on a track. I mean, there's just so many different people on this record. It does sound good. I think it's well produced. I think most of the material is is pretty good. His voice is rough. Like you you can tell that he's sick and he's dying, but uh, I think it, it's just so emotional and impactful that it just really is to the benefit of the record that that he allowed himself to sound like that on a recording. I think it, it works uh, to the record's advantage. Uh, the ballads just like will rip your heart out. She's too good for me, especially uh, keep me in your heart. Just gut wrenching tunes, you know, no sarcasm, no joking. It's just kind of like vulnerable and honest and staring down death and grappling with what's happening to him. It's just really, really powerful. I love Prison Grove with Ry Cooter, his awesome slide guitar work on that track. So cool. Um, El Amor de Mi Vida is a really pretty song. The rest of the night, I think, is really life affirming and celebratory. So it's not all like super down and oh god, I'm dying and that kind of stuff. Like there's some like there's some good rockers on here. The Joe Walsh tune where he's like shredding it up is really awesome. Uh, I think it's a really strong strong record. I think it's a proper send off. Kind of touches on different things that he was good at throughout his career. And uh, yeah, it's just really emotional and 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 good. It's a good w- uh, way to close your career. Um, for me, an even better final statement than Black Star by Bowie. I just think it's a really strong four-star record, The Wind. Okay, uh, my number three is going to be Life Will Kill Ya, which sadly prophetic title there, and a bunch of the songs, Don't Let Us Get Sick and Life Will Kill Ya, sort of like, geez. I mean, that was 2000 before he knew, before he was diagnosed, but um sadly the song titles reflect what would happen and um i kind of agree with rolling stone almost i like it more than acceptable boy so maybe one album after um but i think this despite it sounding very like 2000s which it does like the sound of the acoustic guitar i think is like very 2000s but I do like he's kind of stripped things down. Uh, it's simpler, effective, the nice harmonica. I don't think he's trying so hard with his lyrics to be like funny and clever. A little more, you know, from the heart, a little less trying, I think helps. I like the piano and the title track a lot. It's kind of dissonant. Some unexpected phrases pop up, which is cool. Back in the High Life, I think, is a very good cover of the Steve Winwood song. And uh, Don't Let Us Get Sick, I think, is a really touching, again, simple, effective, just Warren guitar. Just, you know, I like that simpleness to the album. Uh, There's not a lot of guest stars at all. Um, Some backing vocals, Uh, you know, Jim Ryan and Chuck Prophet are the two uh guests uh so as a whole i just like the stripped down nature of this album uh zivon sounds good i think uh, everything is just nice it's not trying too hard and i think that works all right um uh, my number three is bad luck streak and dancing of school from 1980 i think on this one he's pretty much going for the same sound i don't think there's like a big change in philosophy or like i don't think he's going for something different than he was going for in the previous two records. I just think this one is much less successful. I don't think it sounds nearly as good as the previous two records. It also really stumbles out of the blocks. Uh, I think it gets off to a super rough start. Uh, opening, you know, the title track, I think is just okay. Not not great. And then A Certain Girl, which is a cover. It was inexplicably the lead single. Uh, I think it was the second and final song of his to reach the Hot 100 after Werewolves of London. I don't think that's a very good song. And a lot of like the uh, backing vocals on that one are, are kind of annoying. The ahs and all that kind of stuff that, that's going on. Uh, normally, the backing vocals on his record are incredible and they're so well arranged and they sound great. But I think they, they kind of ruin that track. And then uh, Jungle Work, uh, which was co-written with Calderon, isn't very good. I really don't care for the production on that song at all. So first three tracks, I mean don't like them very much like a real like nosedive after 
uh, excitable boy is what you're thinking listening to it, but it really starts to turn around with the ballad Empty Handed Heart, uh, which I think is really good. Then you get Play It All Night Long, which I think is a great song with a uh, you know, great cutting commentary about the American South. Some great lap steal by David Lindley on that track. Genie Needs a Shooter, I think is a good song. Uh, Gorilla, You're a Desperado is pretty funny. Uh, you got Great Pedal Steel on the excellent uh, ballad, Bed of Coals. Uh, so, and it also closes really strong with Wild Age, and which has those great eagle harmonies on it. So it ends up being a pretty solid record. It just opens so poorly that I never really want to listen to it, never really want to put it on. Um, the production isn't bad, but it's a definite step down from the previous records. I still think it's a really solid effort. There's a lot of good songs on it. Um, just got that weak start. Four stars for Bad Luck Streak. All right, Bad Luck Streak, Dancing School's my number two. I have it four stars as well. And uh, I think it's a little more guitar focused, which I don't mind. It's a little more muscular sounding. Production's not as good. It is, it's not 80s sounding, but like, I don't know, if it's in the 80s and immediately things just don't sound as good. I don't know if it's just like a trick of uh, the year or what, but it's not quite as crisp as Excitable Boy. It's perfect production uh, highlight of that album. But I, I like the songs better on this one, actually. I don't mind the title track. I think it's decent. I think Jungle Work is pretty good. And I get what you're saying about a certain girl. Uh, <laughs> the back, the I got a girl. What's her name? I can't tell you. Oh, like that's it's funny the first time, but they do it like 12 times. And by the last time, it's kind of annoying. That's that repetition that you get. Uh, but I do like Don Felder's. Uh, country style guitar on it so that works for me I, I don't hate it like it's it's funny it's it's enough play it all night long I can't decide if I like the satire I think it's just like too easy um, and it is ironic that he stole Sweet Home Alabama from Skinnerd, and then he's going back at him with this he must have been called out on it or something uh, and the cheesy synth as a fiddle riff I don't love either. That's that kind of 80s sound that's like popping up a little bit. I think Genie needs a shooter is pretty good. I like the orchestration. It's a little too much repetition though on Genie needs a shooter. Like just, that line just pops up so much. I think it's a little old. Uh, Bill Lee though is a strong one. I uh, like the little harmonica solo. Grill your desperado is good. And the two best tracks are at the end, Bed of Coals, which T-Bone Burnett has a writing credit on. Might have stolen that piano riff from Sabbath. It sounds a lot like uh, Changes, which is funny, but uh, I love the lap steel, the piano. You know, he, he plays it straight, which I don't think he does quite enough on this album. Uh, but when he does, it's great on that and Wild Age, which is just phenomenal. Love the swooping guitars. Uh, those backing vocals, which are usually a highlight of his work, and they're great on this whole album, but Wild Age in particular, uh, just great. So four stars. I thought this one was, was pretty good. I liked it more than Excitable Boy, but I'm sure most people will not. All right, my number two, I'm skipping over four and a half stars. I think he's got two five-star records, and my number two is The Self-Titled from 1976. I think this is the true emergence of Warren Zevon. Uh, you can just kind of pretend Wanted Dead or Alive doesn't exist. Um, he's now on Geffen's Asylum Records, which is like the home of the Laurel Canyon 70s singer-songwriters. Um, the level of the writing on this is just excellent. Just great song after great song, I think. Uh, just at a level beyond almost anyone else at the time. Produced by Jackson Brown and, you know, brought to life by a who's who of L.A. musicians, session players, uh, session players and, you know, big names. Uh, Lindsey Buckingham, Stevie Nicks, Carl Wilson, Glenn Fry, Don Henley, Phil Everly, Bob Glaub, Bonnie Raitt, David Lindley, J.D. Souther. And of course, Wadi Wattel on guitar. You know, I've got the often sarcastic and, and biting lyrics. And I, I really like the way that on his 70s records pairs with that warm and inviting production and, and a really pretty harmony vocals. And it really does a great job of kind of softening him, but not too much. You, you get just enough of the, that kind of rough, uh, curmudgeonly type of persona. 
Uh, you get some vulner- vulnerability on Hasten Down the Wind. I love the solo from David Lindley on that track. Uh, but then you get a track like Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me, and you really get that full dose of his humor. It's a really good rocker, really funny song. Uh, this record also has my 1976 song of the year, uh, The French Inhaler, uh, which I think is incredible. Just such good writing. Carmelita is great. Hasten Down the Wind, Desperados Under the Eaves. I think all of these are among his best best songs and just like master classes in songwriting. And in fact, I would say that his best songs are on this record. I think this is the best example of his writing. There are just a few songs that don't quite fit in perfectly and kind of make the flow and running order of the record feel a little off. So I think my number one works a little better as a full album. Um, But yeah, there's just no topping songs like French and Hailer and Carmelita and Desperados. It's just that's about as good as you get in the 70s. So, uh, number two, five stars, Warren Zevon. All right. My number one, an album that, at least in my estimation, is so far beyond all the other ones. It's one of those discographies. I mean, I think the last one was like PJ Harvey, where there was really just one album that I really liked. And this would be uh, Warren Zevon, the self titled. I do think it's a five star album. And it kind of shadowed, it casts a long shadow on everything else. Everything that I think works on this album, uh, you know, his his wit and humor and self-deprecation and the clever lyrics. Excitable Boy to me just sounds like he's trying way too hard on every single track. Uh, you lose like all the like heartfelt stuff, like Hasting Down the Wind and the French Inhaler. And it just, I don't know, nothing about Excitable Boy makes me excited at all. Like, this is where all the good stuff is for me. Uh, Frank and Jesse James, Mama Couldn't Be Persuaded. Some cool kind of like country rock uh, stuff, which I liked. Um, You know, it's got a big, grand, full 70s sound, very much Southern California. A little bit of, you know, jazz rock in there. It kind of splits the difference between the Eagles and, you know, Steely Dan. Uh, a little bit, you know, a little Randy Newman, <clears throat> I think, in his lyrics, which is cool. Uh, I think his voice sounds great. So much good character and all the great backing vocals just all over this album. Lindsey Buckingham does great work. Uh, Phil Everly. Um, you got Don Henley and Bonnie Raitt and Stevie Nicks, who I think are great. Really love Bonnie Raitt's uh, harmony vocals on Join Me in L.A. You got Carl uh, Wilson. It's just like a you know, killer's lineup here. Killer lineup, Murderer's Row of backing vocals. And they just sound so good when they all get together. Uh, it's like listening to the Eagles with a little more darkness in there. A little bit better songwriting. But, you know, there's also very heartfelt stuff. Hasten on the Wind is so pretty. Uh, so earnest which is great French inhaler uh, on that bridge when he gets like a little rougher and you can almost hear his like voice cracking a little bit is just beautiful uh, Muhammad's radio has some killer backing vocals from uh, Lindsay Buckingham Stevie Nicks maybe the weak tracks uh, I'll sleep when I'm dead which does a little too much of the repetition thing and backs turned looking down the path sort of just floats by a little bit but Carmelita is great great lyrics a little uh, Latin flavor to there join me in LA like I said love the backing vocals from uh, Stevie Nicks and Bonnie Raitt just a great song a little jazziness in there Uh, reminds me a little bit of Steely Dan and Desperados Under the Eaves I think is his best work as far as lyrics goes Uh, the arrangement's fantastic the strings are great on those backing vocals when they come in phenomenal um so this for me is the only zivon i really need i think it's pretty much perfect and sort of casts a long shadow over everything else especially excitable boy so that was my warren zivon experience i started off with this track because i didn't even realize about uh wanted dead or alive so i was like well this is great. What else is in store for me? And I was just like, oh. so I got one out of it at least. 
All right, my number one is Excitable Boy, and it's real close. They're both five-star records. Um, I think they're more similar than you seem to think they are. This one, obviously, a bigger commercial success with Werewolves of London being a huge hit for him. And that's a somewhat silly track, maybe more of a novelty song, but it's also very dark. And there's so many like hilarious little like seemingly tossed off lines, like I'd like to meet its tailor. And those are all those little things that give uh, Zevon's writing so much character, I think. Um, you also, of course, have the Fleetwood Mac rhythm section on that track, which is great. Uh, Russ Kunkel plays drums on the majority of the record, and I think his drums sound fantastic on here. But you also have a couple other players like Jeff Percaro on Midnight in the Switching Yard. Mick, uh, Rick Murata is on a few tracks. You've also got several bass players, Kenny Edwards, Bob Glaub, John McVie, Leland Sklar, Denny Korchmar is the primary guitarist here, but uh, you still do have a few contributions from Wadi, who is also uh, promoted to co-producer here with uh, Jackson Brown. Uh, I think the title track does like upbeat and fun music with dark lyric juxtaposition better than almost any song ever. I think it's totally twisted, but also totally delightful. I think Roland the Headless Thompson Gunner is a great piece of storytelling shot through with Zevon's unique humor. Accidentally Like a Martyr, really good ballad. I uh, love the chorus on that track. Tenderness on the Block, I think a really good mid-tempo tune. I love the production, especially on that one. Uh, Nighttime in the Switching Yard, probably the weak link on the record, at least as a song, but it does give some of the great players a chance to flex a little. Picaro on drums, really good. Lawyers, Guns, and Money is a classic, just like a perfect song. I went home with the waitress the way I always do. How was I to know she was with the Russians too? It's just such a, a great opening line for a song. It makes you super interested in, and invested in where the rest of it's going. The piano line there is really catchy and infectious. I think it's a, a really strong song. And I think most of this record is just really engaging and sounds great. The songs are great. And I think the way the songs hang together here really work really well too. So giving it the slight edge, but it's super, super close. Five stars for Excitable Boy. So there you go. Kind of a, a, a weird discography for me in that I consider Warren Zevon to be one of the greatest songwriters of all time. I think he is an incredible writer, but the ability of him to make great records compared to that ability to write great songs, I think is a little, you know, a little off he should have been making better records than he did i think often maybe he just didn't think enough about the actual making of the record and think enough about what the production should be and how it should sound and how the song should work together and instead he kind of just like i have these songs i'll call up all my friends and we'll record them and it'll end up sounding like whatever the times sound like and i think that's to the detriment uh for him and his discography. Uh, but but again, I think he is a phenomenal songwriter, just uh, top tier for me. Yeah, I mean, I have to say I'm pretty disappointed uh, overall in this, in the entire discography. And like, I know he's a good songwriter because I can hear all of the good stuff, at least in the self-titled. And I mean, I... I I know Excitable Boy has well-written songs, but there's just something about them that turns me off. So I don't, you know, fault him for that. But I don't know. After that, like, I don't know where the great songs are. There were very little that was like, wow, like this is an immaculately written song. I just get way too much of that sort of just relying on these catchphrases throughout songs way too much to make him that interesting to me so i don't know people say and you say he's a great songwriter he, he may be but i for the most part didn't get that i got hey i really love these backing vocals and i think the production is fantastic and the 70s stuff and then after that it's like okay some cool guest stars but there are very few songs where i could say like yes that is a exquisitely written track outside of the 70s anyway all right, so let us know what you think of Warren Zevon, uh, how you rank the records and what you think of our list. Drop all of that down in the comments. Uh, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you have not yet done so. Hit the bell for notifications so you know when our new videos are dropping. 
And then aside from that, just check the video description. You'll find links to all of our social media as well as our website and our Patreon if you're interested in supporting us further. Uh, we also have a merch store that you'll find there. So follow all the links. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you tomorrow for our top 10 favorite Warren Zevon songs. Thank you.